Hey guys, Filthy Robot here, bringing you another tips and tricks video. This time, talking about warfare in the ancient and classical era. Um, first and foremost, let's meet our cast of characters, the military units that you have available to you during these particular eras of warfare. Um, these consist primarily of the archer, composite bow, the chariot, the, uh, the horseman, the catapult, the spearman, the swordsman, the warrior, and the scout. Um, realistically, the warrior is only good pretty much for uh, escorting units against barbs early, um, getting some early tribute perhaps, and otherwise just guarding versus barbarians. Uh, the warrior is fairly useless in attacking cities in this age, this age of the game. It's just too fragile. Uh, potentially you may get some use out of upgrading them to spearmen, depending if you're down that tech tree or not. But in general, the warrior is really not something we're going to concern ourselves with. It's just too fragile a unit for what we're doing here. Um, the scout would be ruled out for similar reasons, except the scout has a kind of uh, secondary defense, a secondary uh, use rather, as a harasser and city capture unit. Uh, its ability to move across rough terrain without losing all of its movement points makes it somewhat valuable in, uh, in combat situations. Um, the catapult we're also going to rule out. The catapult is too fragile and too expensive for what it does. It's uh, 50 hammers, that's as much as a composite bow um, and quite a bit more than the 37 hammers of something like a chariot um, without having any bonuses to combat strength or any bonuses to defense and needing to move and set up before shooting which makes this unit uh, pretty much the worst unit in the game. Um, you're almost never going to be in a situation where a catapult is going to help you more than a composite or a chariot would because if the catapult was, you know, the catapult's bonus is it has a better, better, better ability to attack um, cities basically but any player is going to just focus your catapults if that is really the game the game changing element is because you have a catapult there the player's just going to kill it because it's super super fragile and super vulnerable we're really not going to talk much about the catapult because it doesn't have any place in the current metagame in terms of combat um, the rest of these units are fairly relevant to um, the combat you're going to see in this particular era and let's talk a little bit about their roles um, the archer suffers a little bit um, from the same problems as the warrior does. It's an extremely fragile unit, especially against melee, um, but it's dirt cheap at 26 hammers. Um, and really one of the, the best parts about the archer is that it upgrades into the composite bowman, and it upgrades fairly cheaply at just uh, 70 gold to upgrade uh, an archer into a composite bowman. Um, the composite bowman is clearly a stronger archer. It has um, it's a mildly mobile unit in the sense that it's not like the catapult. It can move one square and then shoot, which makes it uh, pretty decent as a ranged unit, um, although not amazing. It also gets the benefit, uh, and for these of these units here, the scout, the warrior, or the scout, the swordsman, the spearman, the composite, and the archer all get these. The two um, horse style units do not although uh, we'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute, they get the bonus of twofold. The first is if you hit F, you see the stance changes on these units. This is fortifying the unit. When the unit is fortified, it has a 20% combat bonus to defense, so um, it's going to go up in combat strength. Horsemen and chariots cannot fortify, so they can never get that. If you, let, if you finish your turn as the, with these guys fortified, not only will they heal, but the next turn they'll start with a 40% combat bonus instead of a 20% combat bonus. This is never offense, so if I shoot, I lose all that bonus, but it is a defensive bonus that these types of units can use that these other types of units cannot use. Um, the second bonus of the archer the archer units and the melee units here is that they get terrain bonuses. They get positive terrain bonuses, not just negative terrain bonuses. If you were to put this, um, any of those types of units I just mentioned, uh, in rough terrain, so in jungle, on hills, or on, in forests, or some combination of those, like for example a jungle hill, they get a 25% combat bonus to defense. Um, that's, a, that's on top of their fortification bonus, so if you're fortified on a hill for the first turn, that's 20% and 40%. Excuse me, 20% and 25%, so 45%, and two turns would be 20%, uh, 20%, and 25% for 65% combat strength and defense bonus there. All right. Um, horsemen and chariots don't get that. They can only ever get negative bonuses in terrain. So let's quickly talk about terrain because I think um, some people don't really realize that there's a difference here. Um, these are your raw terrain that you're going to get. Desert um, has a that's wrong. It says there's no combat bent modifier, but there is indeed a combat modifier. Maybe we won't look at this. <laughs> well, maybe we'll just look at the mouse over here. Um, when you leave it for a moment, maybe I have to mouse over the units. Yeah. So, uh, 
that's not giving me very useful tips right now. There's what I'm looking for. Maybe it's not all desert. Maybe it's just floodplains. Maybe I was wrong. Ooh, looks like I was wrong. Cool. We're learning something. All right. So different terrain gives you different combat bonuses for being on it. Um, this is hill grassland. Okay, I'm feeling a little a little worried now that the, the desert isn't showing that. My understanding is desert is minus 10%. Perhaps it's only floodplains that are minus 10%. So units on um, floodplains for sure, and I thought all deserts, but perhaps just floodplains, take 10% extra damage from being fired on. Um, the same for marshes. The marshes are uh, actually 15%, not 10%, but it's the same type of deal. If your unit is on a marsh and gets fired on, it, will take, uh, it has 15% less um, combat strength for doing that, uh, for being on that tile. Um, I think those are pretty much only the the only ones that matter. There may be some terrain penalties on snow, or that's a hill though. Is there any snow in here? And I don't think there is on tundra, but I'm not entirely certain about the snow. Can't move on that ice. And we don't have snow on this map. Perhaps not. But either way, um, the ones you're most likely to encounter, marsh and desert, there are some. Uh, uh, bonuses or, or disadvantages to being on. It sounds like it looks like just from this the uh, floodplains. Although I actually thought it was raw desert too. So perhaps just the floodplains. Either way, minus 10% for floodplain, minus 15% for marshes, plus 25% defense in rough terrain from jungles, hills, and um, forest. All right. Enough about that. Um, let's talk a little bit about the roles of these units. Um, as I said, this is your. These are your kind of go-to regular range unit. Um, they can move one tile, shoot, do some damage. Uh, they get the combat bonus, they get the defensive bonuses from being on terrain, so they're decent in pretty much all the terrain types. Um, and they can be fairly tanky uh, when you have fortified sitting in a position. Um, their, their role is dealing damage, clearly. You want to be shooting other units, shooting cities with them. This is how you're going to kill stuff. Um, the melee units are um, two real roles. Their first role is a blocker unit. They are you put them in a location that you do not want enemies passing through or getting around, and you use them to impede the enemy's uh, movement and impede the enemy's ability to do things. They want to soak up fire in general. Uh, their secondary role is if you can, attacking melees into uh, ranged units is uh, particularly good for you. Melees are um, 11 com melees are the same combat strength for ranged and uh, melee attacks. Uh, combat the, the ranged units up until the Gatling gun basically aren't. Um, see this the, has 11 combat strength. This is the combat strength it will use if it's shooting or being shot by ranged units. If it's being attacked by a melee unit though, this is the combat strength it will use. So attacking melees into range is going to be advantageous for you in terms of just the trading value. Um, the Chariot Archer is basically a much better composite bow um, that is limited in its terrain utility and also limited by a strategic resource. Um, the Chariot Archer is basically three times as fast as a composite bow. The composite bow can move one tile and shoot. The Chariot Archer can move three tiles and then shoot, uh, which makes it very, very useful. It has 90% um, of the damage of a composite bow. A composite bow has 11 range strength. The Chariot Archer has 10. It actually costs less than the composite bow as well. So it comes in at something like 75% of the cost, 90% of the damage. And depending on what terrain you're on and whether or not you're fortified, it has somewhere between 50 and 87% of the hit points of a composite bow. So all around, um, the Chariot is cheaper, it's 37 versus 50, um, a lot faster, similar damage, similar hit points, especially in open terrain if you're not fortifying. Um, and that makes really uh, the Chariot the premier, um, a gr the premier damage dealing unit of the ancient and classical era. Um, clearly we're not talking about unique units here, and the unique Chariot units in particular are very, very powerful. Things like the uh, Hun's Horse Archer, the Egypt War Chariot, or the Indian War Elephant, which are all basically modified versions of the Chariot Archer, all very, very, very powerful. Um, and then we have the Horseman. The Horseman is basically a Spearman. He's a, almost the same combat strength. He's combat strength 12 as opposed to 11. Uh, costs 50 instead of a Spearman's 37, but can move four tiles and can hit and then and can attack and then move after attacking, which nothing else in this era can do. Uh, horsemen are fairly expensive, um, although you can uh, negate some of that cost by building a stables. Interestingly, although the Chariot Archer is a horse unit, it is not a stable unit. Um, you do not get a 15% production for building uh, Chariot Archers out of a city with, uh, with, with uh, stables, although you do get a 15% production towards horsemen. Um, this means horsemen are not all that much more expensive than chariots. They're only about 20% more expensive than chariots. And if, you, if a horseman attacks a chariot, chariot has 6 melee combat strength, horseman has 12. 
Um, a general rule of thumb, three times the combat score, almost uh, basically one hits. So if you have three times the combat score of a unit you're attacking, you're going to basically one hit them. Um, two times the combat score here means you're going to do a very significant chunk of damage to them and probably not take all that much in return. Um, horsemen have a number of uses. The, the first use is harassment. They can do a lot of uh, pillaging, so pillaging luxuries, pillaging roads, stuff like that, moving around, being mobile. Um, they are decent scouts. They are decent at um, combating chariot archers or other uh, units that are pushing into a place uh, in the sense that they can chase chariots down, they're just as fast as chariots. And they're also very, very good if you have a road network. Um, they kind of, they're the ancient and classical era equivalent of the knight in the sense that if you have a road network, you can hit and move back. And what it will allow you to do is focus fire from more positions. Um, I should say this is kind of a general rule of thumb for Civ. Civ is about, it has a limited number of units, one unit per tile, and it is about maximizing the amount of focus fire you can do to your opponent. Um, and horsemen are essentially, in some sense, when they're used to hit and move back and allow you to cycle multiple horsemen through the same tile hitting the same unit, they basically are another ranged unit that can shoot on that tile. So um, we'll, we'll talk about some scenarios and I'll try to explain that point a little bit better, but they're kind of in a unique, uh, a unique role relative to these other units uh, in the early game. Um, all right, I thought I would take this from the approach of first looking at this from an attacker's approach and then second looking at it from a defender's approach and kind of giving you uh, you guys the mindset that I would have as either an attacker or a defender coming after some fixed positions um, and go from there. So let's say that, let's spin a scenario here, you're in the early game, this is what's likely to happen. You're expanding, you're both expanding, so let's say attacker starts over here, the defender starts over here. Um, they're both racing for this settlement spot or in this area, somewhere for these resources. There's, you know, the silver, the truffles, so a river system, and, you know, some decent growth tiles. So they're both racing for this spot. And uh, let's just say the defender settles first. And the attacker's settler's left wandering over here. Attacker is pissed off. He's like, this was my settlement spot. How dare him? He forward expanded me, which he didn't really, but, you know, that happens all the time in games. I want my revenge. I want my city. I'm going to go after this. Okay. Great, here we are. This is what the early game Civ is about. It's about uh, defining your empire's borders, setting up lands that are going to uh, help you succeed throughout the ages of civilization. Okay, so let's say that's the scenario. Attacker is in for a bit of a tough push on this. This is a very well settled city. Um, Let's, okay, so we're, we're, we'll do the attacker first, that's fine. It might be easier to do the defender first, but let's, let's, let's stick with the attacker first. All right, so a couple things that you want to consider when you're deciding to attack a player. First and foremost, you should be considering the target and who the target is. So you should be looking at things like your hammers. Uh, what is, and I can't do it here because I'm using the same sieve for both the attacker and the defender, so it's not going to give you an, a representation of that. But F9 brings up the demographics. Demographics brings up your... Uh, it will tell you your values, it will tell you first place's value, it will tell you your values, and it will tell you uh, the last place player's values in terms of these. Um, production is a huge deal in war. Both sides are going to, in a, in a war with competent players in a situation that doesn't have a ridiculously defensive area, both players are going to lose units. Um, if you have enough uh, production that you can replace units faster than your opponent than it does, you can wear your opponent down and eventually take positions, even if they're uh, difficult to attack positions. You should be aware of your opponent's hammers and your hammers in terms of your production uh, before you go into a war with someone. You should really just be kind of aware, how am I doing relative to them? Am I going to be in a situation where I have the hammer lead or do they have the hammer lead and what do I need to do about that accordingly? Um, you should be worried about location. Um, some cities are very easy to take. Uh, Cape Town is a particularly terrible city for defense. It's wide open on all sides, all flat land, uh, it doesn't have any bonuses to defense. It's a very, very, very vulnerable city. Um, this, this city here, Defender Number 2 City, is a particularly strong city for defense, especially from this direction. We'll talk about uh, the directional stuff in a moment, and we'll talk about why this is a particularly strong city in a minute. But you should be looking at the location of the city you're planning on attacking. Um, you may find that some cities are just too well defended to attack without very specific unit combinations or too well defended to attack this early in the game. Um, some of the stuff that contributes to um, a location's defensibility, defensibility, probably not a word, a uh, location's ability to be defended, is, uh, is the city on a hill? 
the being on a hill is a straight up 25% combat bonus. Is the city a capital versus a non-capital? The palace own, uh, adds a defensive bonus. The palace adds a 2.5 um, defensive bonus. I'm not sure if it adds hit points. I don't think it does. Um, does the city have walls? W walls add five combat bonus. So okay, so regular units have 100 hit points in uh, Gods and Kings or Brave New World, I mean, the expansion pack we're in now, Brave New World. Uh, regular uh, units have 100 hit points. Uh, a city has 200 hit points, and a city with walls has 250 hit points. Cities heal 20 hit points per turn, and um, walls not only grant additional hit points, they grant, they grant additional combat strength. And the stronger a unit is, so the less damage it's going to take. So this city is 13 strength, uh, composite bow is 11 strength and archer is 7 strength. Uh, if this city were to get walls, it will go up to 19. I mean, it might even be higher than 19 strength. I'm not sure where the 25% multiplier plays in. Let's actually have a look. We can sort that out fairly easily. Uh, let's go ahead and give them walls. Actually goes up to 18 strength. Um, so yeah, okay. So just 18 strength on this. But then compare 18 strength to 11 strength and you're starting to see uh, we're almost getting to about double the composite bow strength. So it's important to have an idea, does your opponent's uh, city have walls? How quickly are they likely to get walls? This kind of stuff. Um, you should be considering player skill. Um, it's harder to attack better players. Surprise, surprise, surprise. If you don't know the player's combat skill, you can't evaluate that. But if you know they're a particularly good or a particularly bad player, that should play into your decision of whether or not you're going to attack and how you're going to attack. Um, you should evaluate the first move or just player quickness basically is what you're looking at so Civ is designed to be a turn-based game and we play it in simultaneous mode which means that everyone takes their team their turn at the same time um, this is really problematic for the Civ mechanics uh, and it really gives an advantage to people who are very quick on their moves and very quick um, with the basically their response time to I don't know the server the host whatever it is that determines whose moves go off first if you're fighting someone who's very 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 quick or who has very good first moves who often gets the first move you're in for uh, a more costly war than you would be otherwise. Their resources are going to go further. It's basically like having one more um, production advantage. But let's say you evaluate these things and you decide that Defender over here is a prime target. You're going after him despite the fact he has a hill city with, uh, with walls on a river with really beautifully defendable lands. Um, and let's say, you know, that's, that's where you're going. You're going to go after him anyways. He took your spot. That's what you want. Um, how are you going to do that? Well, you should do some preparation first. It's really unlikely that if you just build a military unit every turn and after you build five military units, walk over and decide to attack him, it's really unlikely that's going to succeed. Because as your military demographics go up, it's broadcast on the demographics page, especially if you're top military. And if you're not top military, your average military would go up. And if you build a unit every, let's say you're building a unit every three turns, after the first time your military score goes up, this guy might go, hmm, I need to build a military unit. And by sure, by the time the second military unit pops out, he's going to have built one. And then your, your score is going to creep up, and his is going to creep up, and you're still not going to be in a position where you have enough of, an, of a force advantage to take him out. So what you want to do is you want to do something which is called pre-building units. And this means, um, let's say you want a composite bow, and we'll say a warrior. You'd never use a warrior, but let's just pretend for the sake of this example that you want a composite bow and a warrior. And um, you're gonna, you want basically a couple composite bows and a couple warriors to go attack him. What you can do is you can build this, this composite bow up until it only has one turn remaining. And then you swap in the production around, and you build the warrior up until it has only one turn remaining. And then basically what you've done is you've invested the production in these units. You're not paying upkeep for them because they've never actually been produced. They don't count towards your military score, so you're not spooking the opponent. And you can basically produce them on demand with just one turn uh, to pr produce each of those units. This is called pre-building. You can pre-build units in as many cities as you have. And this is a very good way to plan an attack because really the best attacks involve an element of surprise and to surprise players you need to not be broadcasting your actions through things like demographics. So I really strongly suggest that you pre-build units. In general if you're preparing to war someone it's really good to look weak and you can look weak by not keeping things near their borders, not keeping military units near their borders, not having first army, pre-building units instead of um, 
instead of actually having units, if your units are wounded, they have less of a combat score. You can hide your military strength having wounded units. And then if you're planning on attacking with um, an upgraded unit, so for example, if you're planning on attacking with composite bows, but you currently have archers, if you can delay upgrading the archers into composite bows until right before you're about to attack, it also will reduce your combat strength, uh, your combat uh, score, your soldier score. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to downplay the size of your army in terms of the demographics that they can see. Now, it's no good if you're doing this outside their borders. If this is the guy you're attacking, you got units lined up around here, and they're a little bit lower in combat strength because you haven't upgraded them yet, that's not going to be... Uh, that's not going to do it. So you need to hide your army too if you can. Don't let his scouts see you building up. Don't give the, the goal away early because if you give it away early, you'll give him time to defend. And defenders have an advantage uh, in terms of the, the combat aspect of Civ. So um, if you're attacking into someone, especially a well-defended position, you really need to not give him any advantages that you can, uh, that you can, that you can keep for yourself. So don't, don't give the fact you're doing this away. Um, Golding up, gold upgrading units is another thing that's very, uh, fairly interesting. It's maybe slightly more important in the later eras, but you can still do something which is called, you can still do something like a composite bow rush in in the ancient and classical era. In which case, what you're actually doing is you're saving up gold, and you're trying to do a timing push with composite bows. So you save up gold, build some archers. Archers are very cheap; they're 26 uh, uh, production as opposed to the 50 of composite bowmen, and it costs 70 gold to upgrade from an archer to a composite bowman, and that's an instant upgrade. So what you need to, what you're doing if you're going to basically try to timing push someone is you save up gold and you build a couple archers or pre-build a couple and then build a couple, and then your combat score doesn't show as very high. Uh, and then basically right before you attack, you, you finish research and construction, you upgrade all your archers to composite bows, and then you go. Um, also, the combat score is based on the uh, melee strength, not the ranged attack strength. Um, this is true for tributing, and it's also true for the soldier score on, on the board up here. So um, units like the archer don't actually contribute all that much combat strength, whereas the, the spearman will literally contribute more than two times as much uh, combat strength as the archer. Um, or, like, for example, the swordsman is double the combat strength of the, the composite bowman, even though um, they're really not that much stronger. Um, Alright, so pre-build units, gold upgrade units, time your attack for technology, so time your attack when you're getting construction. You can tell who has what technologies by looking at the cost of technologies. The cost of technologies go down as more people have them researched. So if no one else has construction researched, um, you're going to see that based on the cost of that tech, or if only a couple people have it researched, you'll see that based on the cost of that. You can potentially... Um, attack them before they have the technology to have equal tier units and that's really advantageous for you if that's the case because their units are going to be a error behind and not quite up to the task of dealing with your units. Um, all right let's say you wanted to attack this particular um, this particular city and we're going to talk when we get to the defender side we're going to talk about all sorts of reasons why this city is very hard to attack but let's just say that this is a city you wanted to attack. Um, what you're trying to do when you're attacking cities, the goal is not actually to kill all their units, although sometimes that can be a goal, but in general, the goal of attacking a city is to capture the city. Um, you don't have to go after this. This is actually his expand, defender number two, as opposed to defender number one. There's nothing saying that you have to come after this city first. You could potentially loop troops around over here and go after his capital, although his capital is fairly painful to attack too. Or potentially you could um, avoid the, the kind of annoying choke point that is this side of the river, and you could come down around past Paris, although that's not going to work in a real game because the borders are going to have expanded, the player's not going to like that. But let's say Paris wasn't here. You could potentially sneak units in around here to attack from a weaker side. But either way, um, decide where you're going to attack from. You don't want to attack into the worst possible position, which is basically right here. And if, and if you do decide you want to attack into the worst possible position, A, be, expect, be expecting to lose troops, and B, you really need to do your best to modify the terrain. And this is kind of the next part of what I want to get to. Um, this distance is not nice for reinforcing. Um, it's three, what is it, three, six, it's nine tiles away, and it's nine tiles where seven of the nine or six of the nine are over rough terrain. That's really, really long. That means it takes, on average, your units are going to take one, two, three, four, five, it's going to take five turns to reinforce from this city to this city. And that's a really long time for you, especially since it's only going to take him about two or three turns to reinforce over there. So what I recommend is roads. If you're going to attack a player, you pretty much want roads towards the front lines. Um, 
the roads are really going to be uh, beneficial in terms of reinforcing your troops very quickly. Um, be aware, I mean, roads come with an opportunity cost. This is gold. You have to pay upkeep on them. They're expensive. You have to put worker time into building them. Um, it can be a lot, especially early. But certainly to smooth movement over rough terrain, you're probably going to need roads, especially if the, if the war goes on for any length of time where you need to reinforce. Um, additionally, this city is a pain to attack. It's a pain to attack because there's no tiles that can shoot the city except for this hill. Um, and these tiles directly adjacent to the city. Because this is situated on a hill, uh, the city can shoot. The, shoot. the city doesn't care if it's on a hill or not. The city can always shoot two tiles around it. But units in the city can shoot also two tiles away from here. So units in this city and the city can shoot to any of these tiles in here. Oops, these tiles right there, rather. And in here, too. But the, the, city, the tiles on this side of the river that can attack this particular city are only this hill, this tile, and this tile. Because the rough terrain in this tile and the rough terrain in this tile blocks your ability to shoot from any of these other tiles over here. Which means you really need to get rid of this rough terrain. You can't be taking a city down, especially a city with walls, with just one composite bow able to shoot it. It will actually heal faster than you do damage to it. Um, and it has a lot of base hit points anyway, so it's just going to take forever. Really what you should be thinking about doing is getting units on the cattle, getting units on this hill, getting units on this forest, getting units on here. All of them need to be able to shoot. And to do that, you need to clear this terrain in here, which means you need to bring workers. Um, you need to bring workers in to chop this. Um, Quick note on that, if you are bringing workers into a war, and workers are extremely useful in a war, both on offense and on defense, be very careful which workers you bring. You don't want to bring uh, workers to a war that are stolen city-state workers if you have the possibility of losing them. Because if a player captures your worker and it's a city-state, it was originally stolen from a city-state, uh, the, the player is given the option to return that worker to the city-state for a large amount of influence. And uh, you really don't want to be giving your opponent free city-state allies while also losing workers. So be aware which cities, uh, which workers you're bringing. You can rename units. Uh, I use a mod at the uh, Enhanced User Interface mod. And on Enhanced Inter User Interface mod, you can rename any unit you want by right-clicking on the name there and renaming it. So rename your workers to, uh, you know, whatever you want. So, you know, don't risk or whatever you want to call it so that your workers don't go to the front line so you, that you know where it's coming from. Um, all right, so roads to the front, workers to the front. The workers are going to be clearing rough terrain. Um, you could also potentially... Um, well, we'll talk about that in just a second. We'll talk about that in just a second. So that's the preparation, right? Bring workers um, to recap. Look weak. Pre-build units. Try to surprise them. You can do gold upgrades. Time your attack for specific military technologies. Put roads to the front so you can reinforce quickly. And bring workers to the front so you can remove defensive terrain bonuses that are benefiting the defender. Um, if you do attack, try to attack from a weak point. The worst place to attack this city from is in, in around here. The best place to attack it from is over on this side where it has no defensive bonuses at all, a bunch of open terrain that you can very easily move into. Um, and you can actually get to that terrain. It's quite a hike to get down around here, but it's a potential option, especially if they aren't doing good about scouting. You can sneak an army around here and come in from the side. Um, we already talked about chopping terrain. You can also great general terrain. So um, in, this slow, in this particular, as it's set up right now, um, there's no way you could great general, but let's say that you really wanted to all in this war and uh, potentially you also found this spot appealing as a city. What you could do is you could drop a city here, buy this tile over here, and then this would now be your terrain in here. And great generals can be planted up to one tile outside of your terrain. So you could plant the great general over here, and then you could take over this terrain that's in the way. And the advantage of taking over terrain is that it allows you to build roads in it and uh, denies it from the opponent. And also, it sets up a general. Generals adjacent to cities do hurt units in the city. So if you planted a general right here, the, the citadel would hurt units in the city. Um, and also it gives you a staging point that's very difficult to dislodge because it's your territory with a guy fortified in a citadel and the citadel is 100% combat um, bonus as well as in your own lands giving you healing for 20 turns, 20 per turn as long as you're not doing anything else. So potentially you can do something like Great General into their lands and this is again mostly to remove choke points is what you're doing as an attacker because um, good players are going to set up cities in such a way that attacking them is very, very costly. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's very costly because of the terrain surrounding them, and generals and workers are a way to modify the terrain of a, defense, of a city that's defending against you and modify it in a way that's going to facilitate your attack. All right. Um, another rule of thumb is spend as little time as possible in range of the city. The city, especially early, has a very powerful uh, range attack, 
And if it has walls or the, the player has the um, tradition policy oligarchy or um, if yeah, <laughs> or if there's a unit in there, for example, the city does a lot of damage. And you don't want to spend a lot of time playing in range of the city or fighting in range of the city because the city is essentially a 250 or well, 200 or 250 hit point unit with an attack that you can't stop that doesn't take that doesn't lose combat strength as it takes damage. Other all other units um, as they as they take damage do less damage. The city does full damage regardless of its hit points. So the longer you can spend outside of the uh, the city the better, or rather the less time you spend in range of the city, the better. Uh, and that being, you know, if you have to, if you're trying to take the city and they don't have any defensive units, moving in, moving in with something like a very fast range unit, like a chariot, and then shooting on the turn you move in, minimizes the amount of turns you're going to spend in range of that city. But if you're fighting a war over this way, where you're trying to kill these other units, you really don't want to spend time in range of that city, because the city is going to chew up your units fairly quickly. Um, and that is free shots for the defender. So stay out of range of the city if you can. Um, you want to pillage defensive roads and luxuries. Uh, luxuries, of course, because if a player is unhappy, their units take a combat penalty hit. So if you can pillage luxuries, like sneak a horseman or a scout in the back and pillage some luxuries, that can help with the happiness. Pillage roads if you can. Roads are placed for a couple reasons. They're placed for the gold connection, the city connection. They're also placed for moving military units quickly, and they're also placed for doing things like giving a defender a specific advantage, like over hills or through rough terrain or across rivers. So if you can pillage um, defenders' roads, that will also help you in your attack. So do that as much as you possibly can. And really, you should be going for an objective. Um, it's not necessary. If your objective is to wipe this player out, it may eventually be necessary to kill this secondary city, but really you could potentially go after his capital first. There's no reason that you have to come through this city. This city is, if anything, better defended than the capital uh, in terms of its location. It may just be better to go and attack the capital directly, um, although both of these cities are pretty, quite painful to attack. All right. So let's switch to the defender's side for a moment. We talked about what the attacker should be thinking about doing as he's doing that, about how to hide your attack and use the element of surprise. Um, let's talk uh, about the defender, and then we'll talk about some generalities, or well, some, rather some things that apply to both the defender and the attacker. Um, when, you, when you are expanding, you should always be thinking about the defensive locations you can plant. Um, sometimes this means you have to be a little less greedy in your in your settlement pattern so that you're not settling on flat land on the wrong side of the river. Sometimes this means that you may not get every um, every type of luxury or um, bonus resource that you want in there, but you should be thinking about where you are relative to your likely opponents and what you're trying to do with this city. Um, this is a great expand. This is a very, well, in terms of defensiveness, this is a very defensive city. It's on a river, on a hill. Um, the river means that units attacking across the river, uh, melee units that attack across the river, take a 20% combat penalty, and also they use all of their action points. So if things like a horse could not attack across the river, then move away. It takes all of its movement points to do that. It gives you a, the river itself gives a very nice barrier to enemies uh, moving in. So um, if you were to station units like around this area, basically, the opponent has a couple options. They can put units along their, uh, the, the lip of this river, but those units around, along the, rip of the, the lip of the river can't hurt you. Um, but if they, and if they move units across, those move, units take all of their action points to cross the river. And as they take all of their action points, you can move back and do a bunch of damage to them uh, and basically penalize them for moving across the river and hit them long before they get a chance to hit you, likely for two rounds since you can shoot them at the end of the turn they move in and then again shoot them at the start of the next turn. Um, so rivers, being on the right side of the river is quite nice for defensive purposes. It's very difficult to push into a lot of river systems. It kills all the movement points. Um, be aware of altitude. That's another important thing. Um, so be aware when you settle a city, how many tiles can shoot that city? This city, for example, it's on a hill, but it can be shot from this city. It can be shot from this tile, this tile, this tile, this tile, because of this, this, um, this marsh tile right here, which provides access to arrows to that. Whereas this city here, can only be shot from that tile. On, again, I'm talking on the north side of the river. can only be shot from this tile. Um, if you're thinking about from the south side of the river, if you're only looking at the, the south side of the river, this city is extremely vulnerable. It can be shot from uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven tiles all in here that can shoot the city. And this city is actually less vulnerable from the south side than it is from the north side. It can only be shot from these four tiles right here because of this. Uh, so be aware of altitude and the way altitude works. Um, basically, if you're on a hill, um, you can think of it as like two things, right? The height you're on and the, and the, and the terrain that's on top of that hill. So um, 
If you're on flat land, you can shoot across other flat land that doesn't have jungle or forest. Um, if you're on a hill, you can shoot over a jungle or forest, unless that jungle or forest is also a hill. So if you're on a hill with jungle or forest, and let's pretend this was a jungle hill, you would not be able to shoot over that hill because it's basically the same height with the hill, and then you add the jungle on top of it. Um, cities, of course, don't require that. City, uh, units in cities have the same um, restrictions on firing as any other unit, but cities themselves can fire just two units in any direction. Um, all right. When you're settling, also be aware mountains are a nice part of settling. They're, they completely block any sort of units firing into artillery. Uh, so be aware of mountains. Also be aware where your luxuries are. Let's say that you settled here. This luxury is fairly safe from attack from an opponent coming in this direction. But uh, for example, if you were to buy out to the sugar, the sugar and the truffles are both fairly vulnerable to enemies attacking in that way. So you're likely to lose happiness very quickly if you go to war with these cities. So although this, this city will be providing you plenty of happiness in peace times, in war times it's very likely to lose a lot of the happiness it's giving you. So that's something to be worried about. Um, be aware where your enemies are. If you are, play, let's say you're defender here. This is you, defender one and defender two. These cities are great from attack from the north. So if you know your opponents to the north, these are very well settled cities in terms of defensive bonuses. However, if your opponent is south of you, these are both fairly poor cities in terms of defensive locations. Um, it's fairly easy to attack both of these cities from the south. So be aware of kind of which direction or directions you're defending in. Um, uh, yeah, you've heard me probably talk about my videos. I don't like uh, the expanding in lines, or uh, really you kind of want like the block formation if at all possible, because then you have you have uh, you know areas that you're facing out to basically where you can set up the terrain to be as favorable as possible. Granted, you're not you're not always going to have that option to make that occur, but that kind of thought process should be going from your head when you plant cities. Where am I likely to be attacked from? And since I'm likely to be attacked from that direction, what is the best way I can use these lands to defend my cities? Um, you should be aware, as a player potentially going to be attacked, you should be aware. You should be checking demographics regularly. You should be looking for military being built up a lot. You should be looking for average scores of military being going up. You should be aware if you're playing in a high military or low military game. Basically, are people building a lot of military troops or not? You should be aware of who that is. Uh, if possible. So if your neighbor is building a lot of military troops, that's a lot more concerning than if the guy all the way across the world is building, building military troops. Um, you should be checking techs. So early game, there's not a lot of reason for people to be headed for construction. So every once in a while, you should just mouse over the tech costs and be like, okay, so they're up in mathematics for hanging gardens or up in optics for you know the lighthouse stuff or, oh, wait, someone's in construction. Why are they in construction right now? Especially if it's very, very early. That might be that someone is trying to composite bow rush you. And even if you catch that a couple turns earlier, it's going to give you that time to make a, put a little bit of production into military units to defend. Um, you should scout often, and you should post scouts in areas that you're particularly worried about. So um, you should, let's say I'm particularly, let's say I beat this guy to a settlement, and I know I beat him to a settlement. I saw his settler, and I have a pretty good idea he's going to be fairly annoyed about that, and he might want to get revenge on me. I might keep a scout over in his area. And I might occasionally move that into his lands to get a better look or right on the border of his lands and move it out again and leave it on a nearby hill or a hidden hill is even better. So he can't, if he can't see the scout he, and if he doesn't know it's there, he might walk a bunch of military by at one turn and I'll get three or four turns of early warning. That's really worthwhile. That can make, make or break. That can be the difference of losing a city versus not losing a city. So scout often and post scouts in areas that you're worried about. Um, when you improve a city, improve it strategically. So ideally, what I would do if I had no opponents in this area, I would chop this uh, jungle out. It's a river jungle. It turns into a very nice plains river tile with, with civil service. Gives me growth and a little production. I really like those tiles. But in this case, for this city, I would not chop this jungle. This jungle provides a very, very awesome strategic value of blocking anyone from shooting from this tile or this tile. Um, so I'd probably, you can still improve it, you just stick a trading post on it, but you don't remove that jungle because it provides strategic advantage to you to have it there. You can't be shot from a couple tiles because of this jungle. And, excuse me, the same with these truffles. The truffles are uh, forested truffles. Um, you could remove the forest, and it actually is a plain, uh, it's a river, um, but you could remove the forest if you wanted to and still improve the truffles. But there's zero reason to do that here. You just build a camp on it instead, and you keep the forest up here before the exact same reason you kept this jungle up. It prevents people from shooting you from this tile or this tile. So when you're improving, improve strategically so that you don't need to make 
remove every marsh and every jungle and every forest uh, in there because sometimes you want a marsh and a tile that you're likely to be attacked from because it makes the attacker more vulnerable or you want a jungle because it stops him from shooting you. Um, when you're improving, think about your road network. Uh, in this case, if I'm worried about attack from the north, I want a road network that is south of this river so it can't be pillaged easily. So my opponent has to cross the river, use all of his movement tiles before he can get a chance to pillage my roads. It also allows me easy access up and down the river. And then finally, what I would want is I'd want some tiles, some roads that cross the river. Once you have engineering, roads allow you to cross rivers without using all your movement points, and that allows for some very good defensive things. Um, first and foremost, you can... Um, you can move across the river without using all of your action points. So if you have horsemen stationed over in this area and a couple roads in here and roads across the river. So let's say there's a road on this jungle tile and he has an enemy unit on that jungle tile. You could shoot it from the city, shoot it from the unit in the city. Well, you wouldn't do it from the unit in the city first. You shoot it from the city and then you attack with a horseman, move the horseman out. You could attack with another horseman, move the horseman out. And then you could move a range unit in and shoot it with the range unit. And you basically be able to shoot focus fire with four or five units on that tile even though only one or two are actually in range of that. Um, all right, let's see. Um, be aware, which I already talked about this a little bit from the attacker's point of view, it, it applies equally well to the defender's point of view. Be aware of which workers are you, workers that have been stolen from city-states, you don't want to risk them. Um, invest in walls if you're really worried about a player attacking you, especially early walls are a huge deterrent. Um, we have walls in this city, and it's up to 18 combat strength. Um, combat strength, as I was saying earlier, um, reduces the amount of damage you take from people shooting you or attacking you, as well as giving you higher um, military strength when you're firing. But basically, uh, the way it works out in the ancient and classical era is that walls are extremely strong. They put a city's um, combat strength about double that of a composite bowman. And that makes it very, very difficult for composite bowmen and cherry archers to push into a well-defended city because the city takes so little damage from them and does so much damage to them. And this isn't the same in the other eras. Crossbows are fairly evenly matched with cities and artilleries are way, way, way ahead of cities in terms of combat strength. So late game, the walls and the armories and the arsenals and stuff like that aren't quite as valuable, um, especially since you have to keep building each of those um, each of those uh, buildings. Whereas early game, just that one little investment in walls is quite a payoff. Additionally, walls are plus 50 combat, or excuse me, plus 50 hit points. Where castles, arsenals, and um, what are they called? Military supply depots or something are all only plus 25 defense. Um, all right. Also, and I said invest in military roads. Good. All right, but let's say this is this is those are kind of like precautionary things you should be doing anyways. Um, let's say that you do get you, someone does come after you, does come to attack you. Um, what should you be doing when you're under attack? First and foremost, you should be attacking units that can hurt you. Way too often, I see people wasting shots on units that don't matter. Um, this city. Ranged units can only attack me from this tile, this tile, and this tile from the northern side of the river. If he has a melee unit on this jungle and he doesn't have a worker on that melee unit, I don't really care about that melee unit. If it wants to attack me across a river into a hilled 18 combat strength city with like 11 combat strength spearmen, I'm okay with that. He's going to be doing huge amounts of damage to himself and very little to me. Really, the units that hurt me are ranged units on this hill or ranged units in this area in here, that should be my targeting. Um, even more important than ranged units are siege units. If he's stupid enough to have built catapults, kill them. They have almost no hit points. They get no defensive bonuses. He puts a catapult on this hill. It is just a raw catapult with, what, what is it, eight combat strength. So 18 versus eight plus, a, plus in all likelihood a composite is going to almost one-shot that uh, catapult. Um, so shoot units that matter, not just the first unit that's presented to you. Um, a lot of people will try to bait shots with units that they don't care if they take damage, like melee units they aren't using or stuff like that. It's pretty desperate if you're trying to kill the melee units to avoid a city capture. It's unlikely that good players only have one melee capture unit, and it's unlikely that they don't have a horse unit waiting a little bit out of your sight range or a little bit further away to capture a city. So I don't really recommend prioritizing melee units unless you're sure that's the only melee unit available to attack your city and capture it. So prioritize units that can hurt you. Um, prioritize 
units that are more vulnerable. That's probably the second part of that, right? So catapults and chariot archers and horsemen do not receive bonuses from terrain. So just because this is rough terrain, it gives everybody else 25% combat bonus. On defense, it does not give a chariot archer, a horseman, or a catapult 25% combat strength. So it means that your shots are doing more damage. So prioritize units that um, don't receive defensive bonuses if you can. Um, when you're under attack, if someone is coming to attack you and you're worried that you may lose cities or lose to them, prioritize production. Go to your cities, change the, change the growth to a little bit less growth so you can work more production. The immediate production is going to be very, very important. Build more roads. I can't stress the importance of this. Mobility allows you to win wars. So uh, maybe you had a couple roads ahead of time when they first showed up. You need more roads. You need a lot more roads. You need roads so you can do things like use horsemen to your advantage so you can move slow troops like composite bows and uh, spearmen around to your advantage. And that actually gets more and more important as the game progresses because early game roads are only two movement points. Once you have um, machinery, they go up to three movement points. And once you get up to, um, I think it's combustion they, and railroads, you get up to five movement points. Um, additionally, your units, um, you get stronger, more mobile units like knights that are better, quite a bit better than horsemen in terms of their relative strength in the era they're in. Um, that will be more helpful too as you have more roads. So just um, be aware when you're under attack, I recommend building more roads. Um, defend strategic resources and strategic choke points and luxuries. Um, for the same reason that your opponent wants to cut your luxuries and cut your roads, you want to defend them. They allow you to quickly move units um, to necessary locations. They keep you happy and um, they also keep you safe. So I would want to have probably a scout down this area to make sure he's not moving all the way around here or something like that. So just so you can uh, prioritize the strategic value of that. Um, if you're under attack, ask your neighbors for assistance. I know this seems sometimes counterintuitive. Don't clearly ask the neighbor who's attacking you, but ask the other neighbors. A lot of times people do not want other people getting a lot stronger by gobbling up other players. So sometimes, you know, you're being attacked from this guy on the east, maybe you can ask your neighbor on the west, be like, hey, um, would you mind helping me a little bit? I could use, you know, this guy's all winning me, and, you know, if he takes me out, he's going to have two capitals and, like, five good city spots, and he's going to be really unstoppable late game. Can you help me out? Um, now, granted, that's sometimes going to backfire when you're when this neighbor goes, oh, you're under attack from the east, I'm going to attack you too. But, you know, if the situation is desperate or the situation is close or you're worried or even, you know, just if you think this guy's got the units to spare, ask for help. That can really, that can really uh, change the balance of the game. Um, use your great generals. If you have to use them defensively, be aware. Um, be aware of where your opponent's coming from. If, the, if he forward expanded you with a city like this, um, you're likely, he's likely going to try to steal tiles up here and you'll have to think about where you want to put your great generals to steal those tiles back or at least steal his citadels back. Um, if he doesn't have the city, he's just attacking from this city, you can think about planting, planting a general up in the front somewhere that's going to be a real pain for him to get to and really uh, slow his ability to attack you. So think about where you're planting your generals based on what he's doing. Um, and if you do general, try to use that general to really restrict his ability to hurt you. Uh, if you just stick a general in the front of nowhere, it's not going to do anything. You know, it might take him a little longer to take that troops, to kill the troop on that, but eventually he's going to kill it and he's going to pillage it. If you stick it somewhere really good, it's going to it's going to permanently prevent him or permanently slow him down from taking your city in terms of um, where it's situated, always hurting his troops. And this is there's not a, an amazing tile over here to general on particularly because uh, by generaling you would remove the rough terrain in here. So it's a little hard to show an example of that uh, in here. But you know you could think of it just as when you're looking at your tiles, go like where does he have to be to shoot me? And if he let's say he has to be, let's pretend that for some reason he had to be on this archer, on this horse right here and right there. Well, really, the ideal location then for a general would be something right in here, although I realize you can't general on oasis. Don't worry about that. But just imagine, like, if he has to be in these four tiles, a general right in the middle of that really, really, really hurts him. So think about it kind of like in that kind of mindset. Um, you can defend against generals trying to push into your lands by using workers. Generals are a non-combat unit in the same sense that workers are, uh, and generals cannot move on to tiles with workers on them because they're both non-combat units and you can't stack uh, non-combat units uh, in a tile. So as long as there is a worker on this tile, the opponent cannot general directly on that tile. You can't move general to that tile. And you can do that, for example, if you have a road there, you can just swap a worker back and forth for a couple turns and be totally fine with that. You put the worker out, the opponent moves in and steals it, you kill his military unit, 
use a horseman, steal the worker back and move off again. The worker stays right there. He's back to your side. He gets healed every time that happens. And every turn that happens for the uh, enemy general cannot move onto that tile to general it. So you could potentially use that to stall generals. Um, people do that in uh, higher level play all the time. And it's really, really annoying. Um, yeah, so that's kind of kind of where I wanted to talk about from the defensive side of this. In general, um, read the terrain. You should be very, very aware of terrain as you're planting cities and very, very aware of terrain as you're attacking cities. This can make a very big difference to how the war goes. Um, read the demographics as much as you can and as regularly as you can, uh, particularly focusing on things like manufactured goods and soldiers, but also things like the demographics that are a little more delayed in terms of looking at things like the tech tree. Read the civilization and read the player who you're fighting. Some civs have military units, units, unique military units that are very powerful. Um, if you are in an era of the game where that is likely to occur, you need to be particularly worried about attack from them and be particularly defensive in how you place cities and how you uh, build improvements and how you improve your, uh, your road networks and what military units you're leaving around. Um, and beware of the player. Read the player as much as possible. Some players love to go to war. Some players are very aggressive. I'm not one of them, but in general, you know, there are players out there who are very, very aggressive and want to steal your lands. If that is the case, you should be aware of that too and be preemptively um, worried about defense. Some civilizations, if you're fighting against Arabia or Mongolia, where you know you're going to be fighting camels or Keshiks, you need to be planning from that pretty much from the beginning of the game because they are so powerful and so game-changingly good that normal defenses don't apply. This city is totally vulnerable from camels and totally vulnerable from Keships because they can move onto this tile, shoot and move off, and you can do that for like, you know, four Keshiks could do that, or four camels could do that, or basically an infinite number of Keshiks almost, you know, like you get like two tiles deep of Keshiks to do that. If you have to fight camels or have to fight Keshiks, you want things like um, terrain with a lot of... Um, terrain that's particularly expensive to move over. So a raw hill is two, a hill with a jungle is three movement points and can't be fired over by other hills. So you want terrain like that, you really don't want to cut the forest off that as possible. You want things like Great Wall, you want things like mountains, you want things like one tile choke points. You want to be as ridiculous as possible if you know you have to fight absolutely absurd military units like Camels and Keshiks. Um, you want to maximize your firing positions if possible. If Civ is a game about uh, focus firing units down. You don't want to wound a bunch of units and let them walk away because players will go walk away and heal and come back with units that cost them nothing to do that for. You want to kill units, make players waste production. You want to actually get the finishing blow on units and to do that you need to focus fire them. You need to focus fire them fairly quickly. So if you can, look for positions that allow you to have a bunch of units firing but the opponent only has one or two units firing back. So if you're trying to do something like defend um, this choke point, you know, you don't need to stick a unit there. This unit, if you have a unit right there, the opponent can shoot him from four tiles. Whereas if you have units in here, the opponent has to move onto this tile and he can be shot from five tiles. Or actually six tiles in here. So you want to defend back a little bit to make him move into an area where you can focus fire him, not you moving into an area where he can focus fire you. So think about um, defensive positions in terms of that. Um, be aware that Civ is a turn-based game. It's designed to be a turn-based game, and combat actually makes the most sense in a turn-based format. But when we play multiplayer Civ, we're playing Civilization in simultaneous mode, which means that um, there are certain things that happen in the game that really aren't designed to happen that way and aren't balanced to happen that way, but happen that way nonetheless. And that is um, when you push into a player who's on the ball in Civ, as an attacker, you're at a disadvantage because what should happen is you should move your unit in. The opponent should get one shot off if it was turn-based, right? On your turn, you move the unit in. He gets his shots off on his turn. And on your next turn, you get your shots off with units that have only taken one round of fire from him. In reality, in Civ, what happens is he moves his unit in. You shoot it as quickly as you can on that turn. The turn ends, and you shoot it again as quickly as possible. So... There's a bit of an advantage to the defender, and this is sometimes sometimes people try to negate this by last second moving things. This is basically to try to avoid giving your opponent a time to respond, and then you try to first second move right at the beginning of the turn to again give your uh, not give your opponent a chance to respond before you're getting your actions off. Uh, and this is basically 
there's nothing that can be done about this because this, the combat in this game is designed to be turn-based and is not turn-based. And until they fix the hybrid system, which is unlikely to happen, that's really not going to be something that we can do anything about. But be aware of that. Be aware of people looking for last-second moves. Be aware of the positioning to deal with that. And try to get your last-second and first-second moves off because that's how you have to be competitive with players doing that. It's going to be a problem if you don't do that. And that's just kind of the way of life for these things. Um, yeah, so just kind of to summarize, there's, um, you know, talked over a lot of different things in this uh, in this particular video, but the kind of take-home message from this is be aware. Be aware when you're planting cities. Be aware of the demographics. Be aware of what your players, your neighbors are going to likely to be like. Be aware of the military units they have at their disposal, and be aware of where you're at in terms of production and military units yourself. Um, make sure you are not giving painting yourself as a huge target. If you're spamming wonders and not building military and your opponent's building military, you're very quickly going to find yourself in a disadvantage and very quickly find yourself in a position where he's coming to take your lands. Don't let that happen. Don't let that happen. Be aware of what he's doing. Um, be aware of when you have the time to make wonders versus when the time is to make military troops. Um, anyways, hopefully this will um, help you guys a little bit with the kind of early game warfare. It's very much about positioning, very much about kind of planning. There's a lot to do with the immediate goal of um, when you're in war, clicking. So it's, you know, getting your focus fires off, moving units in as a group so that you can focus fire units down very quickly, um, not allowing yourself to have a lot of turns where they're being shot, making your decisions rapidly so you get your moves before them, trying to get your instant heals off, stuff like that. But all of that is going to just come with practice. There's no real way to... Um, to teach that from like just saying do it you know you need to go do that and get used to what that entails get used to how fast chariots are and how devastating they can be get used to hitting with horsemen and moving back get used to thinking about where your com uh, your composite bows need to be so they don't get focused but they can focus fire other players all that is just something you're going to have to do to kind of get good at but what you can think about what you can kind of step back and out of the moment of the game think about are the kind of bonuses and settling decisions and terrain decisions and improvement decisions that you're going to be making that can um, best twist the game to your favor. So take the time to think about those. Take the time to think about production and who you're fighting and stuff like that. And hopefully that will pan out a little bit for you guys in terms of how your wars go. Anyways, hopefully this video will be helpful, guys, and uh, let me know in the comments section. Lots more videos to do, but if you have ideas, feel free to post them. I have a big list, but I keep adding to it, so maybe one day we'll get through it, and if not, we'll have a good time trying. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, filthy out.